Good afternoon, my name's Laura McCulloch and today I'm going to be talking to you about Suffrage and the Royal Holloway Art Collections. The talk looks at artworks by or of women engaged in the fight for women's suffrage from the mid 19th century to the early 20th century. We're extremely lucky at Royal Holloway to have a collection so rich in artworks relating to these women. It is largely due to the collection of one female artist, Christiana Herringham, that we have so many works of art relating to those involved in the fight for women's suffrage. She was heavily involved in the suffrage movement and personal friends with many of the women that I'm going to talk about today. After Herringham's death in 1929, Bedford College was gifted half of her art collection, which included works by her, but also works by other women artists, as well as a collection of Indian miniature paintings, Chinese art, Japanese prints, and an Indian sword. These items were given as her husband, Sir Wilmot Herringham, was the chair of council for Bedford College, and he oversaw the distribution of her collection to both Bedford and Newnham College, which is where Christiana had given college, the college financial support. I'm going to use these remarkable items in the art collection as the springboard to look at a number of women involved in the suffrage movement. I'm very lucky that our former assistant curator, Dr. Michaela Jones, completed her PhD on Herringham and co-researched with me a conference paper on Herringham and suffrage, which uncovered a lot of what we know about these women. Many thanks to her, as without her work, I would not be able to give this talk today. I'm also indebted to Elizabeth Crawford for her research, without which many of the pieces of the jigsaw would not have fallen into place. I'm actually going to start with an artwork which is not part of the Herringham collection. It's a newly rediscovered portrait of Millicent Fawcett, who was so central to the suffrage movement. This portrait was originally believed to be of Emily Penrose, who was the first principal of Bedford College. This was due to a plaque attached to the frame, which nobody had thought to question. However, last year, sleuthing by my former colleagues in the art collections team discovered that the painting was actually of Millicent Fawcett. Firstly, former assistant curator, Dr. Imogen Tedbury, managed to read the very difficult signature of the artist, which you might be able to see in the bottom right of the painting. And she worked out that it was Theodore Blake Bergman. Previously, we'd just been calling it a British painter. Then our cataloger, Dr. Alison Wright, found a reference to a gift of a portrait of Millicent Fawcett being given to the college. And lastly, assistant curator, Dr. Michaela Jones, found an image of the portrait in a digitized catalog of the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition from 1898. And that was able to confirm that it was one in the same portrait because we finally had an image of it. The gift of her portrait to Bedford by Millicent's friend and fellow suffragist, Dorothea Roberts, who was also the artist's aunt by marriage, must have been to inspire those studying there to help the cause for women's rights and to be proud of their studying at a higher education institution. Dame Millicent Fawcett came from a remarkable family. One of her sisters was Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who was the first qualified female doctor in Britain. And one of her other sisters, Agnes, who you'll hear more of later, set up the first professional female interior design company with their cousin Rosa, Rhoda. Fawcett was a leading light of the women's suffrage movement and formed the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies in 1897. It was the largest association of its kind. She became its president in 1897 and continued at the helm for 50 years until finally in 1918, the representation of the People Act enfranchised about six million women. Ten years afterwards, British women received the vote on a basis of full equality with men. Millicent retired in 1919 from active leadership of the Suffrage Union, which had been renamed the National Union for Equal Citizenship. Even before women had had the vote, she founded Newnham College in Cambridge, which was planned from 1869 and opened in 1871. She'd also been engaged with the running of Bedford College and had sent her daughter Philippa there. She also advised Thomas Holloway when he began thinking about founding Women's College in the 1870s. So as well as fighting for a woman's right to vote, she was also very central 
to the campaign for women's higher education. I started with this portrait of Millicent Fawcett as she is at the centre of the group of women who I'm going to introduce to you today. And it's likely that according to Elizabeth Crawford, it's through Millicent Fawcett that some of them came to know each other. As she's the centre of the web, its threads are made from suffrage, women's higher education and art. These are the strands that bind these women together around Millicent Fawcett. The paintings, drawings and watercolours in the collection are proof that these women knew each other, as without their personal connections to each other, the artworks couldn't exist. So these artworks that I'm going to show you are amazing records of the network around Millicent Fawcett and those who were fighting for women's suffrage. I'm now going to turn to Christiana Herringham, who owned or created many of the works that I'm going to talk about today. Here are two of the 160 works by Herringham that we have in the collection. On the left is the head of the Madeleine after Botticelli in Tempera, and on the right is a life drawing of a woman. The first record of Herringham's involvement with the cause was in 1889, when she signed a petition demanding the vote for women. In the same year, she became a member of the Central Committee for the National Society for Women's Suffrage, which was the first national organisation to campaign for a woman's right to vote. Herringham's support for suffrage is likely to have been spurred on by her friendship with the leader of the NUWSS, Millicent Fawcett, and her family. But it's not clear exactly how she met Millicent Fawcett. It does seem likely, though, that it was through her father, Thomas Wilde Powell, whose company, Hesseltine Powell & Co, gave investment advice to the Finance Committee of the New Hospital for Women, run by Fawcett's sister, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. Thomas Wilde Powell had strong ties with the arts and craft movement, um, and he had Richard Norman Shaw design a number of buildings, um, including his Guildford home, Pickard's Rough which had an outdoors dining area featuring terracotta work by Mary Watts. And I mentioned the arts and crafts movement because there are great connections between those working in that movement and the suffrage movement. For instance, we know Mary Watts was president of the Guildford um, Women's Suffrage Society. Um, so I think it's really interesting that Herringham's father, being a, a major arts and crafts patron, seems to have also been very supportive of suffrage and initiated Herringham's um, entry into meeting people who were working on women's suffrage. This is a portrait by Herringham of Millicent Fawcett's cousin, Rhoda Garrett, and it signifies a close relationship that Herringham had with the Fawcett circle. It is also really significant because it's one of only two known surviving portraits of Rhoda. Rhoda was Fawcett's cousin, and she set up the first female interior design company with Fawcett's sister, Agnes. They lived together at 2 Gower Street, which you can see in this illustration from their, house, from their book, House Decoration, published in the 1870s. What I like about this book is that Agnes and Rhoda were very keen to make their design rules accessible to anyone. Um, so it wasn't exclusive. They were very happy to share their ideas. And in fact, their design business was so successful that they even rivaled William Morris in their day. What I think is very interesting is that although museums have many, many pieces by William Morris, and he, that is a household name, unfortunately, their design business isn't really known by anyone and has largely been forgotten. There is only one piece by the two cousins in the v &A, um, in their collections. And I think that speaks volumes about how it was far easier for this groundbreaking duo, their work, because they're women, to be forgotten. Um, whereas other bigger companies run by men are very much household names. Two Gower Street also became Millicent Fawcett's home after her husband's death. And what's really significant about it is it's metres away from 22 Bedford Square, into which Christiana moved with her husband Wilmot after their marriage in 1880. So even just after she's married, Herringham is making sure that she lives close to that family um, that she has ties with and that have ties to the suffrage movement. The portrait itself and the location of Herringham's London home suggest that Herringham 
was part of the inner circle around the Fawcett's by the early 1880s. Rhoda wasn't just interested in interior design. She was also, in fact, a noted suffrage orator. This is one of two images from newspapers that depict her speaking on the subject of a woman's right to vote in the 1870s. She toured with Agnes and other women speakers on suffrage, around, talking about suffrage around the country. And like her cousins, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson and Millicent Fawcett, both Agnes and Rhoda um, had slightly different views and supported the repeal of the Contagious Diseases Act, which saw women forcibly examined for sexual diseases against their will. So even within the same family, um, there were different uh, differences of opinion around suffrage and other um, political incidents concerning women. Um, and I think it's quite interesting that Agnes and Rhoda do differ from the rest of the family in that aspect. Agnes carried on the decorating business after Rosa's early death in 1882 from typhoid. Um, and as I say, in its time, it rivaled Morris and Co in popularity. What's interesting about the portrait of her is that it's undated. Um, and it's not clear whether this portrait is a token of the friendship between Herringham and Rhoda Garrett, or if it's a posthumous depiction of her and meant to be celebrating her life. Either way, it clearly was something that Herringham held very dear. I'm showing you the portrait um, in the state that it is today, and is, that is also after conservation. Um, and it's one of the few pieces in the, num the large number of watercolours and drawings that we have by Herringham that's in this state. It's very used, um, it's quite dirty. If you look at the top, you can see there are a number of pinholes. I think what that suggests is that Herringham had it up in her studio. Um, so it's really something she did hold very dear. Um, and I think that also underlines the remarkable friendship that she must have had with Rhoda. Um, and so I think the state of it, the condition of it actually speaks volumes about the relationship between these two women. I'm now going to talk a little bit more about Herringham, having looked at that close relationship with Rhoda. Herringham's support of women artists is evident in her role as the sole managing director of the Women's Tribune, a feminist periodical, which was very short lived, but it's significant that Herringham was the sole managing director of it. The Tribune was a weekly journal first published in May 1906. It was not exclusively dedicated to the suffrage cause, but it aimed to publicise the efforts and achievements of women and to also provide women with a voice. The first issue stated, women must speak more and more emphatically, more of them must speak, much speech is action, silence is not always golden. The paper published articles by women, including the designer May Morris, also the daughter of William Morris, and prominent suffragists such as Frances Balfour and Millicent Fawcett. Additionally, it featured an article on women artists at the Royal Academy exhibition and reviewed an exhibition dedicated to the sculptor Theodore Glycom. Actually, uh, we have two works by Theodora's father, Count Glycom, in the collections at Royal Holloway. One of them is the sculpture of Thomas and Jane in the, North Quad, in the South Quad, and the other is Queen Victoria in the North Quad. I think it's really significant that this paper included articles about women artists, because as a woman artist herself, Herringham knew it was very, very difficult for women artists to get publicity or even be um, talked about by critics. So her paper was giving space to these women and acknowledging um, their role in the art world. The paper was short lived in August 1906. Having been set up in May 1906, the paper's management was transferred and its title changed to Women in Progress. Although her own foray into publication was brief, Herringham recognised the key role that such publications could play in gathering support for the suffrage cause. In 1909, she donated funds to help launch a pro-suffrage periodical called The English Woman. And in 1908, she pledged £200 to the women's franchise newspaper, which published reports from the NUWSS, the Men's League for Women's Suffrage, and the WSPU, 
although the Women's Freedom League later replaced the WSPU. Despite her closeness to the Garrett family, Herringham emphasised that she was keen for all of the societies to continue being represented in the periodical. Although she was a dedicated supporter of the NUWSS, Herringham also for a time subscribed to the more militant WSPU and donated money to the organisation as late as August 1907. However, in September 1907, internal disagreements within the WSPU came to a head and led to a split of the organisation. The dissenting members founded the Women's Freedom League. They still um, favoured activism, but they weren't in any way supporting the militant, violent deeds that Mrs Pankhurst and the others who had been part of the WSPU favoured. Herringham appears to have supported the dissenting members as she rented out her newspaper's old offices on Buckingham Street near the Strand to the Women's Freedom League at a reduced rate of £1 a week. In 1907, Herringham was a founder member of the Artist Suffrage League, along with Mary Lowndes, who you can see here. The organisation's role was to create propaganda for the cause, counteracting the negative stereotypes of feminists. One of the League's most significant contributions was the creation of numerous banners demonstrating women's achievements and contributions to society for use in suffrage processions. Herring embroidered several of the banners, allowing her to combine her artistic work with her political convictions. Herring and Lowndes were also the League's representative on the committee organising the NUWSS's Great Procession. It took place on the 13th of June 1908. 10,000 women from around the country marched through central London to demonstrate mass support for the cause, carrying over 70 banners for the occasion. And you can see some of those banners here. Most of the banners were designed by Lowndes and created by members of the Artists' Suffrage League. Herringham contributed silks that she'd brought back from India, which was used in banners such as the one on the left, carried by the students from the Cambridge Colleges. Um, and that banner is still actually in place at Newnham College. Very fitting, actually, that it was Newnham, um, because that's the college that um, Herringham gave some financial assistance to. But also, crucially, Herringham herself embroidered at least two of the banners. That for the Women's Writers' Suffrage League, which you can see on the right, and the Artists' Suffrage League, which is in the middle. Um, and they're emblazoned, the Artist Suffrage League banner is emblazoned with the words, Alliance, not Defiance. Very sadly, um, a lot of the banners are still in existence, but cannot be unrolled um, and therefore photographed. So some of the banners that Herringham worked on, we're not able to have modern photographs of. Um, the one that you can see in the middle, the Artist Suffrage League, that's actually a photograph from a 1987 book. Um, and unfortunately, it can't now be unrolled because it's deteriorated um, so much. So it, it's really a little bit sad that Herringham's work is in many ways disintegrating. By employing the traditionally feminine craft of embroidery in the making of these banners, women such as Herringham were able to combine their artistic skills and politics without sacrificing their femininity. The Artist Suffrage League regularly held competitions in which cash prizes were offered to the best propaganda and poster designs. Now, Herringham doesn't seem to have actually taken part in these competitions in that she hasn't contributed some to be judged. Um, but you can see how central she was to the Artist Suffrage League because she actually did the judging in at least one of the competitions. She was also responsible in March 1908 for funding the Holloway brooch designed by the Artist Suffrage League to give to members of the more militant Women's Freedom League on their release from prison. The same year, she also sat on the organising committee for the bazaar held by the Women's Freedom League at Caxton Hall from the 31st of March to the 1st of April. The bazaar included a mock Holloway prison cell, cookery demonstrations, musical performances, as well as a special exhibition of Chinese and Japanese antiques. The mystery donor of the objects for this exhibition was Herringham, who lent her own personal collection for the occasion. And many of these artefacts are now in the collections at both Raw Holloway and Union College, Cambridge. In the same year, 
Herringham was also a founding member of May Morris's Women's Guild of Art, along with many female figures from both the Arts and Crafts Movement and members of the Artist Suffrage League. Now, the reason that the women were so keen to found a Women's Guild of Art is because the Men's Guild of Art wouldn't allow women members. Um, it's very much like the Royal Academy of Arts at this point, there were no female Royal Academicians. Um, in fact, there hadn't been any female Royal Academicians since 1768, when two women helped found the Royal Academy. Um, and so I guess in many ways, these women artists were really feeling the glass ceiling. Um, and it's really significant, I think, that they came together in order to, um, I guess, break through that. Or if they couldn't join these male dominated guilds, they created their own to give themselves a voice. So one of the names that you'll see on this list that's in front of you is Annie L. Swinnerton. Uh, she's about in the middle, just under Marion Stokes. Um, and Swinnerton is one of the women that we think Herringham met through Millicent Fawcett. So in this circle um, that Fawcett had around her, um, she met, Herringham met other women artists um, and was actually able to use her independent wealth to support them. She commissioned Annie Swinnerton to paint her two sons in 1889. And here is the portrait of Geoffrey and Christopher Herringham, painted in 1889. Herringham's commission was very early on in Swinnerton's career, but Elizabeth Crawford has actually discovered that Herringham wasn't the only woman in the Fawcett Circle to commission Swinnerton. So clearly this circle was key to Swinnerton early on in her career. And it seems as if those women um, who were involved in suffrage were very keen to support artists who were also involved in suffrage. I think it was being able to commission a kindred spirit um, to produce family portraits. Swinnerton was born near Manchester and was one of seven daughters. In 1871, she entered the Manchester School of Art where she won a scholarship a watercolour and a gold medal for oil painting. Like many female artists of her day, she was frustrated by the limitations of the training on offer to women artists in Britain. For instance, at this point in the 1870s, women were allowed to go to the Royal Academy schools, but they weren't allowed to undertake life drawing classes until the 1890s, so almost 20 years later. And life drawing was one of the key elements of an artist training at that point. So if you're denied being able to do that training, then it could be argued you weren't allowed to fulfill your potential as an artist as a whole. To supply the deficiency of, of her art education, she traveled to Rome in 1871 with her friend Susan Dacker and studied there for two years. And on her return to Manchester, Susan Dacker and Danny Swinnerton founded the Manchester Society for Women Painters in order to promote the work of female artists and to offer them access to additional training. By 1877, Swinnerton's desire to improve her work took her and Dacker to Paris to study at the Académie Julienne. This was one of the leading art schools in France, but more importantly, for British female artists, it offered them access to life drawing, which was seen as essential for any serious painter in the 19th century but in England was denied to women. Despite the prejudice and restraints on women artists, Swinnerton had a flourishing career. Her reputation led to her friendship with the society portrait painter, John Singer Sargent, and it was Sargent who supported her election as an associate member of the Royal Academy. So in 1922, she became the first woman in almost 150 years to become a member of the Royal Academy despite the fact that, as I said, two female artists had helped found the Academy in 1768. Swinnerton was an active campaigner for women's suffrage, and like Herringham, she signed the petition demanding the vote for women in 1889. And this signing of that petition links us to another of Swinnerton's um, artists that she commissioned, female artists. So this is another portrait that we have of her two children in the art collections at Royal Holloway. Um, it's an earlier portrait. The two boys are slightly younger in this picture. So we think this dates from about 1887. And it's by another artist who signed 
that suffrage petition in 1889, Ethel Webling. Up until Michaela had begun doing her PhD on Herringham, this portrait was believed to be by an artist called Ethel Webbing. That's certainly what the label on the back said. But Michaela realised very quickly that she couldn't trace any artist of that name. Um, but what she found out is that it was an artist called Ethel Webbling, who was a miniaturist and a portraitist. Um, and the other important thing that Michaela found and what has led us to believe that this picture is in fact by Ethel Webling, is that Ethel Webling went to the Slade Art School in the 1870s. Um, and that is also where Christiana Herringham was training at the same time. So it seems as if it may be that Ethel Webling and Christiana Herringham met at the Slade Art School. But it's interesting that they seem to share the same political beliefs because they both signed the petition in 1889. Webling was born to a well-read but not wealthy family. Her younger sisters went on to be successful actresses and as children gave poetry recitals. Webling's father recognised her artistic talent early on and was encouraged to send her to the Slade School of Art in the late 1870s. And in fact, it was her artistic talent that led to um, her friendship with Ruskin, but in fact, her entire family's friendship with Ruskin. Ruskin very much took an interest in Webling's art um, and the family went on to have this long lasting friendship with Ruskin. Ethel kept the painting easel that Ruskin gave her all her life. Another artist who attended the Slade School of Art was Bertha Newcomb. It seems likely that both Herringham and Bertha Newcomb were at the Slade School in 1876. And like Webling and Herringham, Bertha Newcomb was also very supportive of the suffrage movement. Newcomb had a successful career as a figure and landscape painter and illustrator. Her parents were early supporters of the Central Committee of the National Society of Women's Suffrage, which actually Herringham was also a member of too. And like Herringham, Bertha Newcomb was a founding member of the Artist Suffrage League in 1907. So as you can see with a lot of these women, it's the artistic interest and the suffrage interest that um, bring these two women together. It might have been, in this case, the art that started off the friendship, but very quickly they must have realised that they both had interest in suffrage too. In 1909, with Herringham, Newcomb was the honorary sec secretary of a committee that collected signatures of men of standing in favour of women's enfranchisement. The society used the Herringham's home on Wimpole Street as the address for the society, which again just underlines Herringham's role in the suffrage movement. Also, Bertha Newcomb created one of the records of the suffrage movement. Now, I'm not going to say um, that this is a record of a particular moment that's actually true to that moment. Um, it was painted much after the event. But it's really interesting that Bertha Newcomb, in about 1910, decides to look back at significant moments in suffrage and chooses to produce this oil painting of the moment that John Stuart Mills receives the petition from Emily Davis and Garrett, Elizabeth Garrett. Um, so there was an earlier petition before the 1889 one that uh, Swinerton, Webling and Herringham sign. Um, and in some ways was a, a more significant moment because it was the first petition to be brought to Parliament. And for some reason, the women didn't want a big fuss made of handing the petition over to John Stuart Mills. So the rumour has it that they hid it under an apple cart in Westminster Hall, which is what Bertha Newcomb has decided um, to choose to paint. So it, in many ways, it's seen as this very significant moment in the suffrage movement. And I think she must have felt the need to record that moment um, as, a, as a way of kind of reinvigorating the suffrage movement at that time. The petition had 1,499 signatures. And as I turn to my last woman that I'm going to look at today, um, she was one of those that signed that petition in 1866. Her name is Annie Swanick. Um, and she was born in 1813 to a Unitarian family. She was educated at home, 
but unusually she wanted to carry on her education beyond the age that was usual for girls at the time. So in fact, in 1839, she went to Berlin where she studied German and Greek and gained a knowledge of Hebrew. When she returned to England in 1843, she commenced translating some of the German dramatists and then moved on to translating Greek literature at the suggestion of Bunsen. She was very heavily committed to the cause of women's education. She was a member of the councils of both Queen's and Bedford's colleges in London. And for some time, she was president of Bedford College at a point when there wasn't formally a principal. She assisted in the founding of Girton College in Cambridge and Somerville Hall in Oxford and extending the King's College lectures to women. To all these institutions, she subscribed liberally. So um, this is a woman with in independent means and like Herringham, she's giving that to support um, the causes very close to her. And in this case with Annie Swanick, that's women's higher education. She strongly advocated the study of English literature in universities and herself lectured privately on the subject to young working men and women. So it wasn't just women of the middle classes, it was the working classes as well that she wanted to help. Um, in fact, such was her work that the University of Aberdeen conferred on her an honor honorary degree um, later in her life. So that brings us full circle and to the end of the talk. Um, Annie Swanick, as I said, was the only one of the women to have signed that very early suffrage petition um, from 1866. But I hope that you feel that you have heard about a number of women that perhaps you haven't heard about before who were really important to the suffrage movement. As I said, Millicent Fawcett very much is at the centre of those women. But I hope you can see that women like Herringham, Bertha Newcomb, Ethel Webling, they were all part of that web and they were all interconnected. The threads that held them together were the support for women's higher education, women's suffrage, and a woman's right to be an artist. Um, and these threads really kind of combine all these artworks um, that we have in Royal Holloway that are by these women. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that talk. Um, it was part of a, a partner talk um, for International Women's Day, which took place on March the 8th this year. Um, if you'd like to see the first of the two talks that we gave um, to celebrate International Women's Day, you can find the first one on our digital museum as well. Thank you very much for listening.